Welcome to the Old Souls and Seekers podcast, a podcast that transcends the typical personal development journey. You're not new to this. You've read the books, attended the seminars, and perhaps even tried various coaching programs, yet something still feels amiss. Elon and Guy have over two decades of relentless searching and a million dollars invested in their personal growth quest. Here's the revelation. You're not missing anything. You're not even behind. You might have just been searching in the wrong places. In each episode, we'll uncover the most effective, straightforward practices that have profoundly impacted our lives and the tens of thousands of our clients from all over the world. This is about real, sustainable results for those dedicated to their personal and spiritual growth. So get ready to explore and enjoy the show. All right. Hi, everybody. So here we are. What's up, y'all? Thanks for coming in and hanging with me. Thank you for your patience. Appreciate you being here. I see uh, Jim and Zoe in here. Suzanne's in here. Judith, Heidi, Stacy, Dr. Uden, good to see you. Uh, Joy Cantrell is here. We have Annabelle Von Der Osten Second. Wow. <laughs> awesome name. Oziyama, Paul. Ian, what's up, y'all? Feel free to say hi in the chat box. It's really, really good to be here with you. Hey, Dragos, what's up, my man? All right. Well, so it's still a one-man show. Um, Elon comes back on the 4th. He is on his South Africa safari with his family, which is super cool. Pictures he sent back have been really, really beautiful. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, interact with you guys today and, and just find out what it is that I can support you with before I just kind of go on a, on a roll here and start talking. So if you have something that is irking you, something you want to kind of just get curious about and uh, go through a little discovery process with me, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to just look at that with you and do a little exploration. So feel free to drop your questions in the chat box there as well. And if it's your first time with us for any reason, you just joined the community, it's your first Tuesday live then I'd love to uh, also acknowledge you if you want to let us know that it's your first time here as well. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you get lost in what you're doing. I've been, I've been enjoying creating a lot of new content recently and I've been really into um, some strategy that I've been applying to my life that I've been kind of slowly seeping and sharing with this community as well. And so I just keep adding more content to, to that as well. So um while you guys are kind of mulling it over and, you know, something that you want support with, again, uh, I'd love to talk directly to you than at you. But uh, the primary premise of, I think, what we're all doing here is just kind of consistently looking at ways to bring more safety, uh, well-being and connection into our lives. Uh, I had a super interesting experience uh, over the weekend, I did this kind of um, ceremony with my friends, which usually has felt good in the past before. For whatever reason, this one was kind of felt a little bit out of sorts, um, mostly because I didn't enjoy the container that was being held and how it was being held. And that's its own little story. And I kind of knew that going into it, that I was doing something a little bit out of alignment for me. Uh, but I did it because my friends had asked me to host at our house. And then a bunch of people backed out of it but I was um, had given my word that I would let them use my house. And so I was kind of on the hook for, for this experience. And then the next day, like I, I had this, you know, when you do something that's uh, misaligned for you, you can kind of like feel it, whether it's in your mental state or, or elsewise. And so the, the next day, my wife was actually at this really cool event in Los Angeles over the weekend. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have the privilege of following uh, Mateus De Stefano online. I don't want to talk too much about him, but he's a, um, I don't want to call him a, he's certainly a spiritual leader, but not in the traditional sense. Um, again, if you haven't seen his show on Gaia, they're incredible. He's a young Argentinian guy who claims, and it's pretty easy to believe him when you start hearing the stuff that he talks about, uh, that he can um, remember all his past lives. And not just on this planet, but on other planets like Sirius and stuff like that. And his knowledge of um, the makeup of our reality and how dimensional energy works is like nothing I've ever personally heard before, which is what makes it really interesting to be um, in his in his space. 
He has some really, really cool um, interviews with Aubrey Marcus uh, on podcasts that they've done together. And clearly they've become good friends. And even Aubrey talking about experiences he, he's had with Mateus are uh, ethereal and, you know, just really out there, but uh, in, in, in an incredible way. And so uh, he did a special event here in Los Angeles and I won't go into all the details, but my wife has been following his work for like four years. And so she ended up at this uh, Los Angeles event with Mateus and his people and out in the woods. And it was really, really special. So I didn't see her on, on Saturday, but when she came back on Sunday, my wife is a, a pretty attuned healer in her own right. She's done a lot of her own um, work and has been meditating since she was nine years old. So um, she kind of, if you feel into her system, she, she feels like kind of like a, has this like spiritual Royal type of frequency inside of her. And uh, so I, I, I trust her tremendously when it comes to working with my system and doing healing work. We've done a ton of work together over the last seven years. And uh, she just asked me, she's like, what's going on with you? Something's a little bit off. And I was feeling this uh, tightness in my throat and it actually felt like I had a hook from here all the way to my, to my belly. And it was really like something was not off, but just needed alignment. And this is one of those situations that you, you just can't predict. Oftentimes when I talk to people about healing work, I'll say it's going to feel incremental, you know, like these, you know, 1% changes, 1% changes, 1% changes. And then this like quantum leap experience happens. And the quantum leap is usually a, um, like if you've done medicine work and you've seen people purging, it's kind of a rite of passage experience, uh, both the experience and personally, and both to see someone doing, and you, part of this healing process we have is like a purge, sometimes physical, sometimes energetic, um, sometimes emotional, right? All these different things. And so she lays me down and, and the work is always the same. It's like, it's like our consciousness doesn't want to go to that place that's uncomfortable unless another system is present. Right. How many of you guys are, are doing minis just by just say yes in the chat box? Give me your virtual show of hands. And so, you know, that it's like you'll be in kind of an emotional experience. And I do see your questions. I'll get to them shortly. You're, you're kind of in this emotional experience. You feel stuck and then you sit in the mini and this kind of grounded state comes in safety and well-being. And suddenly you find yourself like moving through it. Right. So there's this beautiful opportunity from, from feeling stuck in it, maybe even confusion or frustrated or anger or sadness or grief. And then like suddenly you're with this person and it's like, whoop, it like just starts moving through. And before you know it, there's this kind of stability in your system. And so with like, with really, really big healing experiences, it's like this giant layer gets taken off. Okay. And you can, you can really feel it. It's not like a, no one needs to tap you on the shoulder and tell you that it's happening because what starts to happen is a spontaneous release that is huge and unusual. And it could be, again, like it, it could feel like uh, really strong emotions that you normally don't feel or a depth in emotion that you normally don't feel. It could feel like being completely disassociated. It could feel like nausea. It could feel like a lot of different things. For me, it's usually like a, it has occurred like an, an, an a intense amount of grief and sadness. It's like a part of me is falling away or a part of me that's letting go or a part of me I haven't connected to in a long time. And there's like a lot of emotion about that. And so in that experience of doing something that felt like misalignment, there was this, again, it wasn't a mental reminder. It was like this very strong feeling that came with these visuals of, uh, of, of me as a young boy in pain and in this metaphor that my mind was creating, this young boy was this pain body that I had been carrying around. And it felt to me like I had been swimming in the ocean and the ocean was really scary. And that this, again, boy, right? It's kind of difficult to explain how this stuff occurs, but there was like a, I was using it like a life preserver, this pain body. And even though I was in pain, being in that water while being in pain was really known to me. And that for some time I have kind of created enough stability in my system that I've had this opportunity to completely let go of the pain body. And a lot of it I've let go, but there is this aspect of me that felt like I had 
been putting my hand back and I've been taking this little boy's hand and kind of still dragging him along with me as like a security blanket, even though this was painful, both for him and for me. And so in this experience, I started experiencing this intense amount of grief and sadness. I mean, I was like crying like viscerally and making, you know, really loud sounds. And again, not in control of this. It happens very spontaneously. And the, the vision was showing me that it was time to let go. And so I had a lot of grief and sadness. It's coming up again now a little bit about letting that boy go. I'm not exactly sure why this feels so sad. Just want to honor that that's happening in my system for a moment there. Yeah. Immense amount of grief about this for some reason. Okay. Now I'm at a point where I don't really care why there's grief about that. I just want to honor that there's grief about that. And over here on my right, it felt like this clear blue kind of warm water. If you've ever been to like the Gulf coast or swam in like a beautiful, clear open water, there's kind of a feeling that goes along with that. It had that feeling, had this feeling of like a warm bathtub, a big space. And even though this really felt beautiful, it was like going out here meant no, no life preserver. It meant no lifeboat at all because it's, it's this like unknown territory, right? And so it was this kind of juxtaposition, this back and forth of this experience of both looking to my right and almost like taking a hand of this new frequency and then feeling this grief of letting this little boy go who I felt like if I let him go, he's going to be unsupported. But what the energy started kind of making me experience or showing me was that that aspect of my consciousness or whatever is never going to be left alone anyway. It just lives at a certain vibration and frequency. And that as long as I'm willing to let it go, it's got, that aspect of me still gets supported in this kind of like divine architecture, right? This divine intelligence that, that holds and, and cares for all things. And that that was no longer my responsibility and that I could choose to let go of this pain body. And so I went in and out of this experience for like, I want to say somewhere between 45 minutes and 60 minutes, you know, and, and like, again, very, very emotional experience. And the only reason that I even got to go there was my wife was, was kind of supporting the, uh, the, the space and like holding it with me just the same way you would do in a mini. Right. So just to let you know, this stuff happens. Give me one second. Let me close my door here. <clears throat> So this stuff happens and continues to happen. And the more safety that you generate in your system, oftentimes people will say, well, if I'm going to generate more safety, I'll only experience more well-being. And that's true to some extent. And the safer your body feels, the safer your energetic feel, your energetic system feels, your emotional system feels, the more alignment you have in your system, the bigger the layers can start coming off also. Because if you don't feel safe to feel those things, you're not going to feel those things. And your mind is going to protect you from feeling those things by either just avoiding or, or whatever it is. Right. So just to understand that when we are generating more safety in our system, it's not necessarily that you're going to experience less emotion. You might start experiencing a whole lot more emotion because now it's safe to, for your body to express that. And one of the ways that we purge, right? And in, in that sense is from our emotions. There's kind of like an inherent beauty in being able to reach down deep into our system and feel like wallowing pity or feeling grief or sadness at, at a depth and a level that normally you would not experience. Okay. And for a lot of you guys, you might think like, why would we want to do that? But over time, as you do that and you recognize, hey, this is part of the body's process for healing. And when I'm through with that, what's on the other end is this kind of like open expanse, kind of like that warm open water that I was talking about. And it feels wonderful. And so once you start recognizing there's this pattern, okay, I'm going to go through these oscillations. But again, if I don't go through that, I'm going to carry that around with me. And an aspect of myself is going to have to manage that, put energy on that, try to avoid that, try to compartmentalize that, try to figure that out, right? There's so much energy that goes into what people do in order to not have an experience versus just going through the experience once. And then you get to wash your hands of it. And all that energy with that was trying to hold that together, all the scaffolding that was trying to retain that you can take it down and then you have all this resource in your life again. And then no wonder, no shit, right? Like people can like manifest stuff 
magically out of nowhere that they've never been able to create before because guess what? You have access to all this new energy and there's clear space, right? Two things kind of occupy the same space at the same time. But when one thing falls through, there's a lot more energy for the things that, that are in alignment with our system, okay? In my purview with manifestation, if I could say anything about that, we don't get what we want. We get what we need. And what you need or what you're getting, what you need is always in alignment with the vibration that you're at. If you're wallowing in pity, I mean, you know, and you're just constantly in pain or you're victimizing yourself internally, like your reality is going to reflect that. You are going to be manifesting things that are in alignment with that, with that pity, with that victimization. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong, by the way, with being a victim. Okay. There is a certain life that creates. For most people, I imagine that's not a life that's very enjoyable to them, but that's just one slice of life. That's just one type of energy that you could generate your life from. And there's a whole bunch of experiences that lead to people to coming to the conclusion that things are happening to them instead of for them. I, I was that type of person too for a very, very long time. So I can, I could totally relate to that, but you know, like that's the, that's the, that's the work. The work is always going through that which your system has kind of intelligently avoided for a long time and just always tuning in to what the system is, is bringing through right now as an experience. And when we start building that capacity and that safety to be with the experiences that are actually being divinely and intelligently shown to us, we can start going through, quote, healing work very, very quickly and then have these extraordinary experiences. Now, the truth is my system has been really wobbly for the last two days. Like I haven't landed all the way. And again, that's just kind of part of the course. That does not concern me at all. Nothing, 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 nothing that you do or experience ever stays around forever. It doesn't even stay around for a long time. The nature of reality is it's temporality, right? The temporal nature of reality. Things are coming into existence and falling out of existence all the time. There's no emotion that you've had in your life forever. You've never been sad forever. You've never been happy forever. You've never been neutral forever. You've never been anything forever. And we really want to maintain vigilance in our presence in understanding that. Because if you try to hold on to when you're happy, these happy moments, and then you try to hold on to them, the expectation that you should be happy all the time ultimately is what makes you begin to suffer again, is what brings dissatisfaction into your life and creates the, the giant pendulum swings. And then you're wondering how you got back to that happy place and you try to recreate things in your life that make you happy. And then it takes a lot of effort. You know what doesn't take a lot of effort is just letting things unfold as they do. And then being with however it is the thing unfolds. If you can find satisfaction, and I do, in, the, in, in just being the observer of, of what's unfolding in your life without being concerned for what is unfolding inside your life, you are winning the game. Let me say that again. Because uh, to me, this is what's arising in my life has been for the last year or two. More and more, it just keeps getting more stability is... I'm finding that the pleasure is not in the experience that the body, the animal is having. I'm realizing, right? Self-realization. I'm realizing that I'm the canvas. I'm the objective witness that sits and gets to watch this arising of life. And that the more I sit in that objective witness, it has a built-in and inherent pleasure because that view is a compassionate view. It's the nature of the view is, com is compassion. The nature of that view is unconditional love. We could say that connecting to that view is like connecting to the divine intelligent, one field unification of all things. And it's connecting, it's the part of us that connects to God. It's the part of us that connects to all things. And so its nature is compassion. Its nature is unconditional love. And so it doesn't matter what's happening out here. It doesn't matter what the view is being shown. Of course, it's going to trigger the, the animal in all, all sorts of ways. It's going to bring up emotion, right? I say this all the time. When you watch a movie, you're not the character on the screen. You're the objective witness watching the character on the screen go through an experience. Now, does that stop you from having an emotional experience or connection to that character? Absolutely not. 
But the danger would be, it would be in merging with that character and actually believing that you're having that experience. Then there would be all sorts of fear, attachments, dissatisfactions coming into you, right? And so being the objective witness is like being an unconditional, loving, and compassionate parent that's watching a child discover the world. The child fumbles and falls and hurts themselves and laughs and cries and does all these things. But the nature of the parent, the one that is watching, is unconditional and compassionate love. It allows for the child to be as best as it can, right? And certainly with older generations, there's a lot more of trying to inform the child on how to be or even breaking the child's will and stuff like that. And that's a lot of the evolution and changes that we're seeing right now in, in cultivating relationships with children. And we're navigating that, right? doesn't mean it's perfect, but we're navigating that. So I hope that little dissertation gives you some context, right? about what this experience can be. You know, early on, we talk about this, this work is not about making you feel good. It's about getting really good at feeling. When you become a master at the felt sense, when you become a master of allowing for what's arising to arise, you don't have an opinion about it anymore. You don't try to push it away. You don't try to keep it around. These are like Buddhist principles 101, right? The things you try to attach yourself to, or the things you try to avoid will create dissatisfaction and suffering in your life. I totally agree with that. The only place that you can be to not create suffering and dissatisfaction in your life is to be compassionately viewing and neutral about all things that are arising. Now, does that mean that that always happens? Of course not. We're human beings. We're going to get stuck. We're going to get caught. We're going to merge. We're going we're gonna to stumble and fall just like the child does. You haven't, start, you haven't stopped stumbling and falling since you were a child. That's how the human being learns. I haven't stopped stumbling and falling since I was a child. I'm not out of the trap. I'm just a, maybe a little bit more displaced from the trap, but I'm not fully out of the trap. There are still things that hook me. There are people that do things in this world that I do not understand how they could do that. And I have judgments and assumptions and you know, an anger about those things. It happens. I get hooked. And then I go, oh, wow, look, I got hooked. And then I get to learn. And then I get to zoom out and start observing again. And that's what meditation is. Are you feeling inspired by these podcasts? Is this approach striking a chord with you? Imagine taking this journey even further with personal coaching from Guy and I, right from your own home on Zoom. Join us at our next live event. They happen quarterly. It's an accessible, cost-effective way to dive deep into these transformative practices, not just theoretically, but experientially. Attendees often share that they've experienced unprecedented levels of peace, support, forgiveness, and awareness. Remember, healing isn't just a mental exercise. It must be felt and released through the body. So here's a special gift just for you, our valued listener. Visit intuitivemind.live and use the coupon code old soul to receive 25% off your ticket. The intuitive mind event is unlike any other so impactful that many participants return multiple times, some as many as 10, 12, even 15 times. Plus once you register, we'll immediately send you a recording of a previous event so that you can start practicing right away. Don't miss this opportunity. Go to intuitivemind.live, secure your spot for our next live event using the coupon code Old Soul, and start your transformative journey today. Now, back to the show. Meditation is a connection with the divine. Meditation is having an intimate relationship <clears throat> with this part of us that sees everything from the compassionate view. But for a lot of people, when they first meditate, all they feel is the anger, the sadness, the grief, the stuff that comes up. Yeah, because that's what's in between you and it. That's, that's what you're merged into in your life. And what you're merged into could also be what you're avoiding. If you're avoiding stuff all the time, you're merged into it. You cannot avoid and be unmerged. It's the same thing. It, it feels like a juxtaposition because you feel like you're keeping at arm's bay, but something has to put that arm up there and keep it up there. Something has to hold that energy away. And so if you're doing that, there's a part of you that has to watch that all the time. And that part's merged. So what happens when you let go of the hand and you, you know, you get pummeled with all that stuff? Yeah, at first it doesn't feel very good because you've just spent 20, 30 years saying, I'm not going to have that experience. I'm thinking you're this like 
strong, wise individual who's figured out not to have that experience while also taking up all your energy and then wondering why the things you actually care about aren't working out for you. Because unconsciously, the energy is over here trying to keep that at bay. You don't have free energy. You're, you're exhausted and you're tired and, you know, all the other things that, that people experience as they kind of grow up and they start saying, hey, you know, I'm, I'm having fatigue and I'm having this issue and that issue and all these other things. This is this is the reason why that that's so problematic. Right. And well, we can get back safety. We can get back well-being. We can get back vitality. We can get back our vivaciousness. We can get back all these these points of our energy when we stop arguing and fighting with what's so. And that's, that's what we need to understand. What's so is what's so. It doesn't matter how many messages you send Elon or I about what's happening in your life. And we're always happy to hear because sometimes all you need to know is that somebody's listening. But by sending, you know, like I'm not just saying to us, I'm using us as an example, but it could be with anybody in your life where you're consistently complaining about something. First of all, we need to understand that the consistent complaint is keeping, keeping that reality at play. Has anybody been able to has anybody been able to complain their problems away? Say I. And if not, just say no. I have not been able to complain my problems away. So let's just recognize that this mechanism of complaint that we use is a is a vicious cycle that we unconsciously use to keep ourselves on the very ride that we're trying to get off of. Right? Because what we say and what we generate with our word and vibration matters. That complaint is actually generating that reality over and over and over again, right? So, so just recognize that, that you, we cannot complain our problems away. The other thing we want to recognize is that everybody has problems, okay? And if, you, and if you spend a lot of your time trying to solve your problems, even if you're able to solve your problem, what is going to be waiting for you behind that problem? Anybody venture a guess? And just for time's sake, I'll just put it out there. So behind the problem that you just solved is going to be another problem waiting to be solved. Okay. We are meaning making problem solving machines to some degree. That's what a human being is. Okay. So is there a problem with the problem or perhaps the problem that you're working on is not big enough? Okay. Let me say this in a different way. And this comes from old teachings and mentors that we used to have. They posed this idea, right, about problems. I was like, yep, that, that, that feels true. They're like, so if, if life is just going to be filled with these problems, why are we even spending time working on those problems? Maybe the problem is, euphemism, maybe the problem is, is that the problem you're working on is not big enough. Maybe you need to work on a problem that you can't solve, a problem that you can give your life over to. Now, if I work on a problem that I know it has no solution, then I have no expectation of trying to solve that problem. Like if, if I have a problem that I'm working on and I'm thinking I'm gonna resolve it, then I wake up every day in disappointment and dissatisfaction and suffering that it's not resolved. Do you guys get that? Because my expectation is, is that it should be resolvable. So that I'm attached to it being resolved. And if it's not that, then I'm in suffering. Okay. But if I create a problem that's so big that I know that I can't solve it, then the expectation of solving it falls away. And then so does the suffering. And then even though the problem may not be solved, I live in the curiosity and the ongoing unfoldment of that problem. Right. So like for me, that problem is, is like global transformation. I don't know how to solve that problem. I have no idea how to solve that problem. I'm not disappointed every single day that our entire planet is not transformed. And I get to play the game and consistently look at how can I contribute to helping our planet transform. And that's what our whole business is built around is that principle. I don't presume that Satori Prime is going to is going to solve all of life's problems or resolve everything for everybody. And I'm going to do my part and what I feel is important to me, what I love, 
love about transformation, what I love about working with people, bring my passion, my voice, my perspective, my view, and however that looks, and that's going to be the problem that I'm going to work on. And so maybe as you get off today's call, a, consider, a consideration you can make is what's the problem that you actually want to work on? Because it's much more fun to choose the problem that you want to work on than to have life bring those problems to you. Okay, and, and for those of you guys who've done level two, one of the first things that we teach in module one is how we can just like absolve ourselves of this reality of problems that our mind is creating. Like, how do we just stop playing that game altogether? And what's the game that we could play that resolves 95% of all problems within a matter of days or weeks like this? And it's really just a, a shift. It's a shift in how we perceive, it's a shift in our perspective. And it's very, very powerful when you learn this, okay? So let me kind of go back up here and just see um, some of these questions and how they're related. Yeah. Yeah, so it's always asking, you know, for today, how do I support the people around me who are struggling with their emotions where they don't want to look within? Well, Zoe, you're, you're inherently uh, answering your own question by asking the question. The last part is they don't want to look within. That's your answer then why, why are you efforting to try to support them? Like if a person fell down on the, you know, on the street or something and I ran over and I said, Hey, do you want help getting up? And they're like, no, that's the answer. And if I try to pick them up, they're going to be like, what are you doing? I just told you, I don't want to get picked up. And you're like, well, I really want to help you and pick you up. And they're like, I, I asked you not to do that. Maybe it's hurting them more. That's your answer. So again, like, just, just think about this. I get that that's coming from a beautiful place and with wonderful intention, but I'm going to spend no time in my life, zero, trying to support people that don't want to be supported. I don't spend any time in my life at all, zero, trying to convince people that they should transform their mindset, their emotional state, that they should do healing work. Zero, literally none. I never do that. I did that early on in my tenure because I thought everyone needed to be saved and fixed and that I had something and some answer to give them. And so I, I've gone through those cycles and I understand how uh, deficient and how disempowering that could be in a relationship. You can, you can lose a lot of relationships by trying to throw your ideology on people, especially when you think that you have an answer or you've been doing healing work and now you think you have the answer because what they hear when you're providing support or when you think you're providing support is that there's something wrong with me is what they're probably hearing. Zoe, Zoe can't accept me for who I am. She thinks I need help in some way. There's something wrong with me. And when somebody thinks there's something wrong with them, their system actually closes and clenches up and they're not available for support. The best thing that each and, each and every one of us can do is understand that your energy, your state of being is highly influential. When you walk into a room and you're in a neutral state and you're viewing from compassion and love, that's going to have an impact on everybody in that room immediately. Everyone, everyone you come in contact with, whether they are consciously aware of it or not, is going to have an impact on them. When we see a person who's in a different state, we naturally form curiosity around that person and we start watching them, what they're doing, how they're acting, and we get curious. And through that curiosity, one day they may be open enough to ask you a question about how it is or what it is that you're doing. And it's at that point that you would interject something, an offering, an invitation. But again, it, we need to be very mindful of sounding like we have an answer for something and being much more, uh, it's much more appealing when we invite people to have an experience. Okay. Like if I, if I invite you to go see a movie, I'm like, Oh, like, I, I don't know about you guys, but there's this amazing show on, on Apple TV right now called Dark Matter. Highly recommend that you watch it. It's like no show I've ever seen before. Actually has a, a lot of parallels to the work that we do here and manifestation and reality and, and the multi-universe and stuff like that. It's a really, really interesting show. Like, that's that about that invitation. I want to use that as a metaphor. If I start telling you about the show, why my opinion is right and why you should watch it and forcing it down your throat, you're going to be like, I don't think I want to watch that show, right? There's a really big difference between putting a lot of stuff over here and about trying to prove that you're right about something or that even if it, if, even if the intention behind it is to help somebody, 
versus just putting like this easygoing invitation into, hey, it's a great show. It has a lot to do with such and such areas of life you might be interested in. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, like Elon and I were trained uh, at Landmark for 12 years. If anybody knows Landmark Education, that was our 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 school for for personal development and mindset development and stuff like that. And Landmark has a um, a sales process or a recruitment process that a lot of people don't like. And I I understand that, okay, because it it could feel like pressure, kind of like what Zoe's talking about, and that's why I'm I'm using it as a as a metaphor here. Now, Elon and I, in the 12 years that we were there, probably between the two of us were responsible for like a thousand people registering. Okay. That's a lot. I mean, like a lot, a lot. Okay. Now, just to be clear, we didn't get paid for this. It's not a network marketing thing. Uh, I don't have a toaster at home with Landmark's name on it. I don't have a robe or slippers or anything else like that. The reason we were so good at it is we, we really believed in the work. We saw it transform lots of people's lives and... Uh, what we eventually learned is that you want to invite people to an experience like that without really putting too much emphasis on what it is or what you believe it is or how it's going to help them or anything else like that. It was simply, it was simply this. We invited them to uh, like a week, like a, they would do these like special evenings that were like three hours long where a person who led these programs would talk about the program who was way better at talking about the program than Elon and I were, but we would simply invite them to this program, like they were coming to see a great movie. And that was that, okay? And we took all the weird stuff out of it. We make it weird when we add our stuff into it, our opinions, what we think is good for them or everything else, right? And so Zoe was saying, okay, and with curiosity, it's causing me pain to see them hurting. So that is what I get to work on. Thank you, exactly. So that that's it, Zoe. You get to sit with the discomfort of the way that people are choosing to live their lives. Because what you will inherently hopefully see is that whatever you're looking at out there and judging your these people about that you think they need help with, right? And again, it may not occur to you like a judgment, but I'm just going to use that word here. You can take it or leave it. It's ultimately what you haven't healed within your own experience. So for example, like if, if, if I have turned away from my anger and I don't have a healthy relationship with my anger, when I see anger in the public atmosphere or in my family... I'm also, I'm going to be extremely judgmental of anger. I'm going to want to squash it, get rid of it, avoid it, move away from it. So is it the issue that that person's anger, angry over there? Or is the issue that I have not built a capacity to be with my own anger? And so my internal judgment is now manifesting as an external judgment in my reality. Everything that you guys don't like what's happening in politics or what's happening with a certain society or a certain subgroup of society or minority of society. These are, as there's no issue with that subset of society. The only issue is that we internally have not accepted that about ourselves. And so if we are not allowed to do it, certainly nobody else is allowed to do it. And so what we want to look at is how do we not try to help everybody all around us to heal is how do I leverage this relationship that I have with other people to view my own pain, my own pain body, and then help myself work through that? Because notice, Zoe, for you and for anybody else who's tracking this, because I'm sure Zoe is not on her own, and I totally understand, Zoe, where you're coming from, the intention. I know it's coming from a loving place, right? Is that we want to get rid of that in the world to make ourselves feel safe again. That's all we're trying to do. If we can get rid of the violence in the world, I'll feel safe again. If we can get rid of the anger in the world, I'll feel safe again. If we can get rid of the judgment in the world, I'll feel safe again. Okay, great. So guess what you have guess what you have issues with is your anger and your judgment and your violence. These are all aspects of humanity. And the energy that we normally see them coming out for, out of when we see these expressions is coming from the distortion of that energy. Right. But every energy has polarities, positive and a negative and positive and negative doesn't necessarily mean good and bad. It just means positive and negative. That's what holds a, a field of energy together. We need we need poles 
for the energy to travel between. Right? We are judging whether this side is good, whether this side is bad. Forget whether it's good or bad. Just notice that some of them create distortions in our reality and other ones create alignment in our reality. And we want to be able to use every aspect of the available spectrum and rainbow of energy to us in the cleanest way possible, meaning without the distortions. Okay? So usually these amalgamations that we're trying to heal are the aspects of us that have become distorted. Like anger has become distorted and then it comes out as violence or pain in our society. But the, the energy of anger is really important. In, in our world, we call that being a firebender. Okay. So when it's distorted, it can be rather destructive. When the distortions are cleaned up, that same energy is the energy that manifests like crazy. It's the energy of truth. It's the, the movement and dynamic flow of energy. It's the union between the masculine and the feminine. Okay. So if we destroy that energy or we try to destroy that energy, all these aspects of our reality that make life living amazing, sexual, you know, all these different things would go away. And I imagine none of us want that. And so what we're trying to do here is even impossible. You can't make any ener energy go away. You know, if I was like, get rid of all the radiation on the planet. How are you gonna do that? It's not possible. Energy can't be destroyed. It can't be created. It always was and always will be. Is the problem the energy or is the problem the way that we're perceiving or interacting with the energy? Stop trying to work on the people in your life. One of the greatest breakthroughs and self-realizations that you may have in this work is when you don't have to talk to the people in your life at all to transform that relationship. You won't have to talk to them. In our personal development programs, we have ways for you to be in communication with people that are nonviolent and that can clean things up in that relationship in order to move the needle forward in that relationship, which is, which is really cool. Okay. Having said that today, oftentimes we tell people not to have a conversation. And the reason for that is it's almost more awe striking to realize that you're, that when your energy switches, and you're doing healing work, and you're more in alignment, more neutral, more compassionate, more loving, and that's the view you're taking, that the other that the relationship just naturally changes based on that principle of polarization. If one energy changes, so the other one. If somebody is a victim, the other person has to be a perpetrator. And if somebody's a perpetrator, the other person is going to be the victim. It's just polarity and energy. That's all it is. So if the victim comes out of the victim state, and it becomes neutral, then the one that was doing the perpetration also gets into a more neutral state. Suddenly you see that the per person who is doing all the abusive stuff either diminishes or stops completely. We've seen this over and over and over again in relationships. It blows people's minds. Yeah, Dr. Udin saying actual, you know, uh, actual factual. I can attest to ancestral familial dynamics changing without me saying anything. We see this all the time and it's incredible and the reason we allow you know we we ask people to do that is because we want you to experience firsthand your energetic influence on everybody around you on the environment around you it's it's mind blowing because we all think we're these disempowered people and the only way that we can you know enact some change in this world is by standing on a soapbox and yelling really really loud when does that, you know, when does that really change anything? Like yelling your loud voice into the void. You know, there have been a lot of crazy things clearly that have happened over the last four or five years. Okay. And then you see people take to the streets and, and riot and do all that kind of stuff. I mean, really guys, really, I mean, I'm not saying it's never worked, but how often when that happens, do we see change? You know, that doesn't work. Now, look, I'm not saying not to do that either because making our voices heard is important. And there is an aspect of consciousness that when something goes awry, the best that that level of, of presence and awareness can do is going out to the streets and, and protesting and, and showing that. Like, again, I wouldn't want people to not do that, right? Because 
there are atrocities happening in this world that we need to bring attention to. That makes sense. Okay. But you want to think of it as like degrees of consciousness. Okay. I promise you, like, say Jesus was around right now. I don't think you're going to find Jesus out there with a, with a pitchfork, you know, and like a torch in one hand, like ready to riot. I don't think that was the way he would approach change. Right. So for some people, that's the best they can do. For some people, a, a handwritten note is the best they could do. For some people, posting something online is the best they can do. And for some of us, the best we can do is sit in the silence and go into states and help the, the, the collective consciousness metabolize that energy. Heidi, I don't know if that email was for me or somebody else, but you sent it to me just so you know. Okay. So again, there's no wrong way to approach being alive. I'm just offering, hopefully pointing at some different paths here. And then, you know, um, Suzanne was saying to Zoe, whenever I feel like this, I love myself until my jar is overflowing. Then I go near them and allow them to unconsciously have my excess if they choose. That's right. So like, that's our purview. It's like, do not give from an empty cup. They can feel when your cup is empty. They can feel the little energetic manipulations that are happening behind the field that you think you're hiding so well. You're not hiding it. They can tell. You guys have all, you know, gotten a text message from somebody and you get a little annoyed when you get that text message. And then you write the next text message and it says something so nice, right? You write the nice thing, but the energy behind what wrote it was the anger. Like you, you turn the knife energetically a little bit when you sent it, some passive aggressive is in there. And then they write back to you, is everything okay? And then you write back to them, yeah, everything's totally fine. Why? Happy emoji. And before you know it, you're in a giant fucking argument and you guys are text screaming at each other and you're blaming them for starting the argument when you knew exactly what you were doing when you send that text message. And notice how the mechanism works where it hides from your purview and your view that you were responsible for that because you don't look at the energetics. You just look at the words you're like the words were nice. Why did they take it so badly? And then you go and tell all your friends that this happened. They're like, can you believe such and such did that? Like I was, look at the text message I sent her. It was so nice. But you know, because you've been through that pattern so many times before. Okay, Heidi, um, I see that you're trying to reach out to me. I don't know what the context is. Um, I see. Heidi, yeah, you can send me an email to guy at satoriprime.com and just explain to me what's going on. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what the context of that is. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so Zoe, no, there's no firebender guidebook and, and that uh, nomenclature is not something you're going to find in, in any book, to be honest. That's, uh, Elon and I were part of a mystery school for four, almost five years. And they would use this uh, terminology of benders to describe different parts of the, the consciousness field. And so the part of the field, um, that I was describing about is, uh, is the, basically the heart chakra. They, they call that the firebender. Okay. And the firebender is when you're in the gift, not the distortion of it. So we sometimes in our programs intermittently change, they use that, uh, those contexts. But um, for the most part, uh, if you, if you read the five personality patterns, which we recommend from level one and on, there's a lot of um, uh, that, that, that wording and those patterns and how he describes them is mostly what we use. And it's just so everyone can be a kind of on the same page with the type of maps that we're using here when we're describing stuff. But I want to remind you again that maps are just maps. They're not the truth. They're not something you have to like, you know, put all your bat, all your eggs in that basket and believe it's absolute truth. These are, these are tools for shifting our perspective and opening us up to other experiences. And at the end of the day, the only thing that really matters is the experiences that you're willing to have. You may, you may enjoy me talking or Elon talking and, you know, really all I'm ever trying to do is point at stuff for you. I'm not trying to convince you of anything here. It, it doesn't assist me to convince you of anything. It doesn't make me feel, I, I'm, I feel like I'm past the point where I need to convince people of my version of reality to feel safer. I know what cultivates safety and it's not everyone agreeing on the same version of reality. We can all agree on the exact same fucking thing. It would make me feel not one iota safer. 
that's not how you cultivate safety. We are teaching you guys what has taken us two decades to learn about how to cultivate safety and well-being in your system. That can only be done through a direct experience. And as you cultivate more safety and well-being in your experience, it's a lot less important for you to try to make everybody else feel safe or see things as you see them because it's no longer a threat to you. When you begin to love yourself in all the ways that a human being is, first of all, you allow more of your humanity. There's more expansion in energy in every aspect of your humanity. Suddenly being sad is easier. Suddenly being really happy or being blissful is easier. Being mopey is easier. Everything is just easier because it's just safe to be that way. There's no judgment behind it. But in the same token, you start giving yourself space to be all these things. Guess what? You intuitively start giving everybody else space to be do and be all these things. And then as a byproduct, you're just more peaceful. You're just a more peaceful being. You know, so we talk about safety, well-being, authentic connection, peaceful, all these things all the time. And here's the beautiful part. You don't have to focus on any of those things. You can do this work and never even think about it once. And still you are going to get the benefit of cultivating and increasing all those things in your life exponentially. And it's not because you focused on them. It's because that is what you get as a byproduct of doing this work. Plain old, plain old. Okay. So hopefully guys, that gives you like a, a good overview of things. I really appreciate you uh, interacting with me today and bringing some of these questions. I'm sorry if I didn't get to all of them. Um, but yeah, I hope you enjoyed the conversation today. I'll wrap it up with that. Um, I do want to let you know, uh, if you are not part of our intuitive mind experience, the next one is coming up in September 14th and 15th. I'm going to stick this uh, little button there in the top right. If, uh, if you're listening to this in audio and you can't see that button, so intuitive mind live, our next two day experiences in September, it's going to come a lot faster than you think. It's only six weeks away. They're incredible. You could go to intuitivemind.live to check out the enrollment page and you can use the code live 25 to save yourself 25% off the ticket price uh, in the next few days. Okay. So intuitivemind.live for the page live 25 at checkout, L I V E 25 at checkout to save yourself 25%. We'd love to have you there. So if you're newer to the community, you didn't upgrade your membership and you want to have this otherworldly experience in learning how to generate more safety, more compassion, more love, more peace. Again, these are not things you're going to come to as a, as a realization in your mind, like an insight. The realization comes from our personal experience. If you want to get the full download, that's a great place to do it. Love you guys. Thanks for being here today and we'll see you next week. Take care. Thank you, dear one, for choosing to share a bit of your day with us. We value you greatly. And as a way to give back and help you to deepen these practices, we want to invite you to join our incredible community on Facebook. You can do so easily by going to joinoldsouls.com and ask for an invite. This is our private community where old souls and seekers are able to grow and share their journey with others. We hold exclusive weekly live streams, we answer your personal questions, and offer valuable insights that we won't be able to share here on the podcast. So again, just head to joinoldsouls.com and grab your invite today. And as always, if you enjoy this podcast, please head to iTunes and leave us a review. It's the only way other people can find this show. So if it's making a difference in your life, please share the love. Until we meet again, have an amazing week, dear one.